Welcome to How Things Connect, where we share insight and wisdom on healing, empowerment, and regeneration. I'm so happy today to have as my guest, Olivia Gertling. Olivia is the founder of the Alchemy Center and is a dynamic creative producer, graphic designer, and artist based in Portland, Oregon. She's known for creating immersive environments and interactive events that nurture and catalyze innovation, creativity, and ideation in art, architecture, environmental science, and social impact. Currently, Olivia is developing new models for how we envision collaborative and regenerative culture. Welcome, Olivia, to How Things Connect. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. It's great having you on the show. So <laughs> tell us a bit about yourself and how you discovered your passion for ontological design. Maybe <laughs> what that even is because a lot of people don't necessarily know that what does it mean <laughs> in short uh, ontological design is designing for states of being and um before i get more into what that means and how uh, i'm approaching it how the people in my um in my world are approaching it i can uh, yeah talk just a little bit about why my what my fascination for experience comes from um, so I think for kind of the longest time in my life, I was really hungry to see the world and experience things and meet people. And this, as soon as I was able to, I just kind of threw myself into the world and it started, you know, from like hitchhiking experiences and traveling a lot and really starting to open up all my senses to the world around me. And what I realized is that um, there is obviously the world that you know does its thing, but we come into it with with our intentions and we come into it with our energetic stance, right? And the more I was traveling, uh, I noticed that my energetic stance was shifting into this just really um, deep, open excitement because I was genuinely excited about um, and uh, pleasantly surprised how many, how, how most people are genuinely kind and wanted to help, want to help and want to, um, you know, support you wherever they can. And that was not quite the story that I had grown up with. So it was, um, it was a really wonderful eye-opening moment. And in those formative years is also when I started working in the creative world, in the creative industry. And that's when I immediately knew, like, I have to find my place in this industry. So I started this whole journey of um, professionally expressing myself for hire. And, <laughs> and, um, and that led me to live in all kinds of different countries and uh, travel the world and work. Like you said, I worked in architecture. I started working on uh, bigger art performances and art productions and um, one thing that I always would come back to and that started becoming this, this thread was to create and support creating environments that really meet you where you are. And what I mean by that, and perhaps that's my own, like how I, how I look at the world and how I have access to the world, it really helps me to know where I can go when I let's say I feel I feel social or if I can go to an environment where I know, oh, I want to feel solitude. So I go over there. And what I noticed in like art experiences or event spaces, conference experiences, so often these places would be geared towards one or two states of being. And um, that's it. <laughs> but there are so many more states of being that we all step into at any given time. So I over the years, this desire emerged to create environments that have a variety of options and that through that create this warmth and um, kind of uh, allow people to trust to go into whatever environment feels right for them. And um, over, over the years, I started um, then working in uh, bigger conferences and starting to kind of design the creative uh, elements of these conferences. And that's when um, this ontological design framework that uh, I've been using since 2017 uh, really came forward and was prototyped. And then 
um, a few years later, that's where the Alchemy Center, my company, um, emerged. So that's kind of the short story of all of that. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I was actually watching your Nepal talk. Oh, you did? <laughs> I did. It was awesome. It, you know, the sense of, I mean, it's so important for us to free ourselves from where we've been in a long time, whatever that, and obviously the most obvious example would be going and putting yourself in a different physical location, right? Something yeah. that's completely different, that breaks you open. And I love what you said about having and creating um, these experiences and these spaces that meet us where we need to be met. And mm -hmm. that's, that's incredibly inspiring. Yeah. I mean, you, did so, you watch the design for survival talk? Is that the one that you checked out? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was a, that was a really interesting project. If I, if I may just elaborate on this for the audience here, um, this is about 10 years ago when I got really curious about the stream of consciousness and this inner mind chatter that we have. And uh, because I like experiments, I came up with this <laughs> at the time, I thought I was, I mean, it's, it's great. And it's also a little, really, a little ridiculous. Let's listen to that monkey mind and give it a stage for a week, which to me in that moment meant let's say everything, uh, let's say every single thought out loud for the entire week in an odd environment. And uh, that environment was let's go on this giant trek in Nepal and what that did is I created this little container to really look at all of my feelings and everything that was going on inside me. And that was such a healing experience. And to this day, I'm really grateful that this happened. And, um, and I can only recommend like, I was in a really uh, pain. I had, I was in a lot of pain. I was, you know, I'd suffered a heartbreak and so many things had happened and it was the best decision to put it out there and immerse myself in myself. So to a point that I saw, you know, oh, there's the themes that I always bring up. And because I listened to these transcripts later and I could see the patterns, I could see the themes. And I was through that able to integrate the things that I wanted to carry forward. And then also let go of the elements of myself that were no longer serving me. So it was this really wonderful cathartic experience. And, um, and I think it's really awesome to use everything that's going on in our minds. I'm so fascinated with consciousness and thought and how can that inform art installations and experiences. And I think there's so much, there's so much like uncharted territory still there. And uh, it's a really fun line of work. Absolutely. And I love that you, it's going the opposite, right? Instead of censoring, you're completely removing that and just going, all right, just, yeah. just let it all hang out and let's yeah. see where that goes. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's yeah. creating space. That's literally even that alone. And you didn't even have to, I mean, yes, you went to Nepal, but that act alone is creating space for- It is, yeah. Spread, right? And yeah. Yeah, and it seems to me, because I was looking at your projects, that a lot of your work is, number one, about creating space for having an experience, and then, yeah. number two, through that experience, heal relationships of how we exist in the world with our particular frameworks and beliefs. So, for example, how we relate to ourselves and how we interact in the world and with each other. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, that's a, I'm glad you bring this up. So there's, there's, I feel like kind of two sides to the coin. I think the, the one that happens often at the end is the making sense part mm -hmm. of like, okay, I just did this. What does it mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> and the beginning, right, is, is connecting and, and reconnecting and remembering. Um, and that's where I think that's often the struggle. So if I design an experience, I often look at how can I increase connection, if that's to self or to community or to others or um, who like the world or a specific uh, line of work or whatever, really, how can we reinforce that connection? And um, the way I like to look at experience design when I curate, let's say, uh, an event or an installation, I want to be as non-prescriptive as possible, 
but rather just really hold space. And there are so many different ways of doing this. And excuse me. And uh, what brings me so much joy is when there's a space that was created, seeing how people are just moving through these spaces and genuinely connect. And then you kind of see it on their face. Uh, it's just like really interesting, um, you know, moment when people open up and are not, you know, at this conference to give somebody their business card, but they're there and they ran into the same art installation and they're trying to figure it out. So they are in this now kind of more exploratory play state and the connections that we form when we are in a little bit more of an exploratory state is really open. And uh, I think we all know this from when we travel, like so often when we travel, it seems like it's the most friendliest place in the world where we just went to, but that's not necessarily because it's the friendliest place, it's because we are so open. Mm -hmm. It is because we are bringing that frequency forward where we are just curious and curiosity invites kindness. And yes. Um, so it's this kind of uh, beautiful self-fulfilling prophecy in the best positive way. So when I design spaces that are conducive to that, you know, um, there's connection that happens and then later um, people can make sense of them. And uh, that is, um, I think, the, the a line of work that I love doing because you just never know what happens. And uh, connections are formed. They don't even know what they will lead them, these people to. And you know, years from years from that moment. So it's a it's a very satisfying way of working. And um, I know that sounds a little abstract, but I actually have frameworks and visual frameworks and references that will make that a little bit more concrete. So, <laughs> I mean, no, it, it's it, please share that with us because we'd love yeah, to okay. know about that framework that you amazing. have. Amazing. So I will, um, for that, I will share my screen. So everyone who is on audio here, there will be materials shared. So this framework began in 2017. Um, it was developed by um, my uh, business partners uh, with my company. And this framework has really one main purpose. It is looking at the way we spend our time. I'm going to share a little bit about um, this ontological de uh, design framework that we use with Alchemy Center. And this framework is uh, designed to let us understand the way we spend our time and the way we move through space. So we're going to take a step back from everything we just talked about. And um, you want to imagine a, uh, an arrow pointing up uh, an, an axis that indicates the degree to which we are searching for understanding. Does that ring true? Sometimes we, you know, in throughout the days, throughout our lives, we search for understanding and sometimes we don't. And, um, and I want you to imagine another axis that creates a little matrix. Um, and this other axis indicates the degree to which we are applying our knowledge and our understanding. And what that does is it leaves us with this little matrix that um, is really all we need for our little ontological design framework. Okay, so if we are in the um, upper left-hand corner of our framework, we are looking at um, a state of being where we are searching for understanding, but not necessarily applying anything. And what we call this state is ideation or pondering. And what's really beautiful, if you look at, uh, if you think about uh, ideation or pondering as movements, it is branching out. It is following our curiosities. It is learning new things. It is going down the rabbit holes on the internet. It is being open to learning all about the arts and humanities. And uh, what that does and why this is really where we are mining the raw material for creativity, this is adding new metaphors to our little inner, inner library of metaphors. And I think especially creators may know this, often we kind of recycle our, um, our ideas over and over again because we don't often allow ourselves to step into that state of, of active inquiry. And uh, allowing ourselves to spend time there more often, more intentionally can really benefit how we are showing up in both our lives and in our creative projects. So pondering for pondering's sake is all what we're about. And again, it is 
not with the uh, intention of applying it anywhere. It is literally, I'm really curious about lichen and tomorrow I'm really curious about neuroscience. And the next day I'm gonna look into how to uh, weave scarves. So, you know, it is really all about just being curious. Pondering, we should all ponder more. <laughs> Everyone has more permission now to ponder. And if we move to this next quadrant up here um, where we are searching for understanding and not and also applying understanding this is a really active quadrant and i believe some of you may know what that looks like this is when we are trying to jam on ideas and we're producing and and we're producing um new concepts we are prototyping by the pound and we call this play mm -hmm. play and uh playing is uh the quadrant where we are uh, for example, sitting down with our team, we are, um, you know, we're, we're coming up with new ideas, we're workshopping them. And what's really amazing about playing is it is not necessarily about is this an implementable idea, but rather it is all about um, can maybe these 99 ideas lead us to the one brilliant idea that, you know, may turn into a real thing or real project or real product. What's really fun about playing also is creating environments where people are kind of taken into this uh, kind of, um, you know, kind of really activated, inspired state. So playing with materials is really wonderful. You know, if someone has an art barn in their backyard, that's a great place to go. Or meeting rooms, lots of sticky notes, design thinking, that's where that all comes forward. And, it, and it also, if we, there's this other quadrant here at the bottom where we are not searching for understanding and we're not applying anything. And um, it's not quite meditation or sleeping. It's kind of this really special kind of nothing. And what we call this special kind of nothing is incubation or daydreaming. And daydreaming is that moment that happens when we, for example, take a shower walk the dog or we are on the walk and sometimes and I think we all know this that's often when those little epiphanies and aha moments occur and also when we are in these kind of work minds and we have a more narrow focus on what we're trying to solve we all know that it can be sometimes really hard to find that brilliance in there because we're trying so hard and neuroscientists have found if, is uh, when you are focused on a very specific element of your work or whatever you're trying to solve, you're using a very specific part of your brain. But when you are allowing yourself to take a step back and go into that daydream state, into that default state of your brain, that's when your entire brain in the fMRI scanner is lit up. So we form those new connections and that's where the aha moments come from. And the initial aha moment occurred in a bathtub. So, um, it is, uh, it, is a, um, it is kind of this uh, interesting recipe. And uh, we at the Alchemy Center believe that we can't rely on everyone taking enough showers to solve the problems of the world. So we wanna encourage everyone to be really intentional about it. So let's design spaces that are conducive to daydreaming. What does that look like? Um, I will speak to that more in just a minute. Um, and then to finish off a uh, little matrix at the bottom right hand corner where we are applying understanding but not searching for understanding is uh, the state that we step into when we are practicing. But we are, you know, it's, it's not, it, and we don't want to call it like work quadrant. It's really being an active practitioner of something that you have, uh, you know, passionately immersed yourself in. You are inspired, you've pondered, you've played, you've daydreamed, and now practicing uh, whatever you do to move things forward and to make them happen is uh, actually this, the, one of the most joyful states, at least in my mind, that's where my producer mind comes in. And because I'm an artist and I can uh, come up with fun little metaphors and also fake equations, I'm gonna end this with a little fake equation. Um, so we say at uh, the Alchemy Center, if we do spend a portion of our time pondering and a portion of our time playing and a portion of our time practicing, we get that applied understanding, right? So we go full cycle in our matrix here. And uh, we want to also hold all of this to the power of our daydreams. AU 
applied understanding, it also happens to be the element of gold, which is why this is also lovingly called the alchemy of wasted time. Wow. And this is this is really the bot. This is at the bottom of everything that we do. And I want to uh, I want to take you through a little. Um, I want to take you through a little imaginary journey here. So um, the way we first brought this framework forward was in workshop settings. We used the framework to design different sections in time. Mm -hmm. And what ended up becoming a really fascinating line of work, and that was my personal major epiphany as a creative, was take the framework and put it on the floor plan of this conference. So now we're asking ourselves, where is the practice area, right? And in this case, it was a social impact uh, conference where we first prototyped this in 2017. Uh, the practice area is uh, the keynote speakers. It is the panels. It is where we are learning, uh, where people talk about how they make things happen. Um, for playing, we were like, how do we get people to play with ideas? So we had an area where we encourage, where we had our keynote speakers sit down with attendees during breaks and have little jam sessions. Because we all know sometimes we have questions and talk about it. So we wanted to give people an opportunity to sit down and be around a big round table and talk about stuff. Really simple. For pondering, uh, one example, we had artists capture inspiring quotes throughout the day with calligraphy and we pinned them up on this wall and throughout the day it grew into this massive wall of inspiration and we frame the space as go there and ponder and just kind of you know inquire and have symposia style conversations with each other and so many times when i ran by that area i could see i run a lot doing events. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like tending to the tending to the chaos. You just like run around. And every time I would run by, people would just genuinely dive into these quotes and chat and exchange resources. And it was this really beautiful thing. Um, and for daydreaming, that is when we bring in the art. And this is when we bring in installations. And what is really powerful, and I'm, I have experienced this over and over again, we don't put so many art installations into business conferences and this, there, there seems to be a disconnect there. But like, why would you have a installation? Cause we're talking about social impact here and entrepreneurship. Um, we would frame this, we would explain people this framework every uh, at the very beginning of the conference and give them a very simple compass to navigate the space. And I think that is so important in ontological design, give people a little map, give people you know, little signs so they know where to go. Um, and I think, you know, this, I think that we encounter this in personal relationships as well as in professional relationships. We always think people know what we're thinking, but um, we, you know, it's, it's really good to check in and communicate. And um, so we, we would create these navigation systems and allow people to understand why daydreaming is important. And this is only because we want you to actually digest all this information. So step into this installation, see what happens. One time we had a all faction experience uh, that we set up in this little enclosed room. We had little, um, one of my business partners is an amazing uh, uh, scent designer. And we created this soothing space with plants and beautiful smells. And we would give people watercolors and they would just kind of immerse themselves into their senses and to give people a chance to step back from networking. Um, we also played with, for example, projection mapping installations. We created a piece that was drawing people together through this uh, fabric that we hung into the middle of this big space. And there were sensors attached to those fabrics and the animations that were these like beautiful emerging visuals, they would get more and more intense and gorgeous the closer people would move to the fabrics. And eventually people would meet um, on both sides of these fabrics and start like figuring out, oh, wait, we just did this together. We just activated the animation together. And who are you? So it was really wonderful to just kind of use a very soft and easy metaphor that allows us to place literally anything we want uh, into a space and it makes sense and it connects. And I think that's where the magic of 
being a little more transparent with ontological design, I think is really successful because people, people want to understand why something is there. And if you give them a tiny bit of an explanation, it is so much easier to engage with it. And the dream of the Alchemy Center is to take this framework and put it on a big piece of land. So I ask, what does the ponder area look like? Are we going to have libraries and tea houses and other you know, movie theaters, places where people can sit down and read a book and talk to each other. For daydreaming, um, we have an entire art park and installations and um, a spa area, for example, where people can kind of step back and enjoy nature and uh, kind of, you know, step into this uh, really juicy, undirected place where you just kind of follow your your really your inner your innermost inner curiosities and for playing you know we could we would have these meeting areas and unmeeting rooms and places where people are encouraged to um prototype with their hands and fail and learn from that so that's the that's the that's the big dream and uh with every day that we are um working as an organization we are currently um working with some really incredible land projects and other clients on bringing this framework forward in a variety of different ways and it's a really wonderful line of work and i'm really proud of it and i've uh we have a wonderful team and there's so many beautiful humans in my world that are supporting this and our ultimate dream is to eventually um, also operate on space so we can host workshops also out there. We can have teams come out. Um, I'm very unattached to where this is going to be. It'll be somewhere on the West Coast of the United States. Um, but yeah, so that's the that's the goal. That's where we're headed. Amazing, Olivia. This is so inspiring. And I can just feel your passion and the joy that comes out of you as you just as you go through this. And it's unstoppable. So I have no doubt that your dream will come true because that's what you put into it and therefore it will manifest. And it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And I, I have to say, you know, as you were explaining this, it reminded me of something else, right? When you were talking about giving people a map, because this whole diagram actually reminds me of the cosmological design of, or cosmology and how it's represented in other modalities like shamanism right? Like where you start to look at different points where yeah. we have consciousness and the way yeah. that we apply our consciousness and how, what, and what kind of, um, in the end, what, what reality is therefore created because of that, yeah. right? And it's, yeah. it's incredible. And, and the second thing also is that as you were talking, this is this framework is amazing because it actually activates our whole human being. Mm -hmm. Yes, Completely. exactly. Without, right. Through all of our senses, not just our minds, because a lot of times, obviously, it gets really stuck in our heads and it's like, OK, we can't break free from that. You are yeah. opening through sensory experiences. You're yeah. connecting emotionally, physically, yeah. all ways. And there's something I mean, this is so invaluable because we get, this is the thing, right? We get contracted when we're just stuck in one, in one corner of it. And, you know, you can really get deep and crazy. Like oh, yeah. Thing, right. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But when we can break free, there's this incredible sense of elation and freedom. And yeah. it's beautiful. And so, yeah, it's, it's, I think every conference, especially the ones that are really, that can get a little intense and boring, like we absolutely yeah. need. Yeah, oh, and I, yes, yes, and, and so much yes here. I wanna to speak to two things. So uh, what my, uh, my wonderful business partner, Corey Pressman, um, he often speaks about the, one of the kind of core inspirations for this framework, which was um, a, a essay that was written by Norman Cousins uh, in the 60s, where he was speaking about this dystopian potential that one day we will live in the robot's future. And, uh, you know, we, we will just really disconnect from our inherent humanity. And, um, and he's posing the, the audacious solution, this, this author, to potentially make sure that we could have a poet in every board meeting and in every other meeting where we are creating these robots. And um, 
we think that it is uh, that is maybe a little bit ambitious, but this framework was designed to help that we are that we with each of us is a little bit of that poet in these board meetings, and that is why um, we were we were, we are really passionate about bringing especially people that are not very familiar with the creative process through this framework because I want the engineer of my next iPhone to day daydream and yeah. ideate and ponder, right? We want right. them to be exposed to humanity so we can actually build these human-centered tools and we can create a future where it is about the human. And mm -hmm. what I'm really uh, loving about, you know, I think the last few years, especially, I think there's a really strong desire and movement to one return back to who we really are and to figure out ways to come back to our hearts mm -hmm. and back to nature in a respectful way. Um, if we talk about the way even we look at like ecological restoration these days, it is not, we're, we're moving slowly, not, not super fast, but slowly towards um, restoration doesn't necessarily mean remove the human. It means mm -hmm. educate the human how to be a respectful participant in our ecosystem, right? Like. It's, it's, we can't just remove everything. It needs to be integrated. And I think that integration is point. happening and it's really fascinating and inspiring to see all these different ambassadors of that uh, reintegration pop up all over. And I think the pandemic has really expedited that too because we were forced into this pressure cooker. And um, I mean, speaking for myself, I was able to connect to so many folks through Zoom and it's awesome. And now it was really, it helped me find uh, my people. And um, with that, I, I'm now able to do my work in a much more powerful way. And, um, and I really appreciate that. And I think this is what it takes to collectively imagine a better future where we don't go to conferences that bore the shit out of us. You know, it is it is where we are going to conferences that are giving us what we need and that allow us to step away. And that is, I think, just as that, that is, you know, if, if we look at the, the individual personal level, um, that is, um, you know, when we're in a, in a intimate relationship, for example, we need to also learn how to give space. And mm -hmm. I think the same is true for work environments and for experiences yeah. and for conferences, like give each other space and wellness, accept what is. Yeah, for wellness, yeah. another way you can apply it. I mean, this is this exactly. is really brilliant, Olivia, I just have to say again, it's it's really awesome. And, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned the pandemic and on the one hand, people were cut off because you're cut off from loved ones kind of, and then something else opened right through zoom. Like you said, you were able to connect to a lot of people, but what it did remind us of was, Hey, that zoom connection is awesome, but we actually really need to see each other. We need to connect us. Yeah. And I think that's a, a real reminder that was very healthy, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I wanted to actually talk more about this point because what I've observed, and I wanted to see what you, how you feel about this or what you think okay. is that, I'm seeing in the world, there's these two somewhat opposing uh, trajectories that are happening at the same time, which is always the case, obviously, in the world. But like <laughs> where one is, as you just described, that is reconnecting us back to nature, that's reconnecting us to ourselves as human beings, but it's predicated very much upon, you know, the network, the, the how we belong in terms of being part of a greater system and you know, that actually leads us to system design thinking as well, or design, yeah. you know, system design. And then the other part is going, no, um, it's very uber tech, uber hyper tech, right? And then it's yeah. like, no, it's cutting off. And then I'm going to put you into either metaverse or something else that, okay, you're having connections, but it's actually, it, it's almost um, and this is my biased opinion, but it's almost like a bit of a, just a facsimile of what is already here. Like, why are we making things so complicated when things are right here? And I really wanted to hear your point of view on all of that. The metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, just that contrast and whether you see those opposing sort of different poles that were being pulled in. Yes, I, I love this question. And it's actually uh, a theme that I've been talking to my 
uh, collaborators uh, about for the last few weeks. It's really up in our, in our minds right now. So um, let's see. I think I think we are moving kind of past this kind of honeymoon stage with technology. I mean, it's really new if we look at it, you know, like it's, I mean, even just 10 years, maybe not 10, maybe 15 years ago, that was, you know, we had kind of flip phones and, you know, yeah. all really exciting Sony Ericsson phones with color displays, you know, <laughs> but that's how fancy it was. So um, I think I want to acknowledge that we're technology is this kind of new, exciting, shiny thing still. And we're moving, I believe, now into a stage. And I think that's also what COVID helped us with. Like, I mean, I remember two years ago, was a, it was pretty painful to have a Zoom meeting because nobody knew how to do it. And, you know, cameras didn't work and everything explodes and it's just complicated. And now we're really, we're, we're really, like our literacy, our Zoom literacy uh, has really increased and our technology literacy has increased and it helped I think everyone to kind of get on the same page a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think what the potential is now that we're moving out of this kind of excited honeymoon stage is to bring it all back together. Um, and the way I look at it is I think there's nothing more valuable than, cre you know, creating connections to nature. Like I go out into nature as much as I can. I think hiking is one of my, uh, you know, almost the most healing activity that I can do as a human. Um, and it's something that I want to also do to step away from the screens because a lot of my work happens on Zoom. A lot of my work happens on the screen. Um, while at the same time, seeing technology as uh, something that is getting better and better at helping us be more efficient with how we connect to each other and to nature. What that means is very simply, technology helps us navigate nature and technology helps me find weird places I didn't even know existed because I can Google them and look them up. And now if we look at networks, and this is actually something I'm working on with uh, several groups and several organizations that we're collaborating with is how to create human-centered uh, digital environments. Mm -hmm. And how can we use digital environments to prototype a future that we want to see? So one of the conversations that is being had right now is to create and literally attempt to manifest the uh, and more embodied environments that we want to see in the living built environment. Mm -hmm. And I have both worked in XR, so, you know, augmented reality, projection mapping, um, those, uh, you know, virtual reality in those fields. And I've also worked in architecture. And the way I often function in these projects is I'm a catalyst and I bring people together. And we're starting to have these conversations about how do we use grounded building principles, for example, to create um, kind of a, you know, a, a, a metaverse environment, for example, that is really relatable and that is grounded in physics and that is grounded in how things, how we actually interact with real spaces. And, um, and then in these environments, how do we program them? How do we guide people through them to meet each other, to have the exact experience I was talking about uh, the way we did our conferences before COVID hit, where we had in-person experiences. So how do we now bring an ontological design there? Because in some of the metaverse places you go, you still stand there and you're like, I don't know where to go and I'm just going to leave. So, you know, and that is because like, where, how do you, where do you meet people? Where do you pick them up and where do you guide them to? And I think this is true for both real events and uh, digital environments. So what I'm pretty excited about is to uh, start, um, and there's, like I said, there are several projects on the way, and um, it's, a, it's a really exciting opportunity. And I believe in the power of manifestation. One of my, uh, one of the things I love doing is, is sketching things up and uh, kind of imagining them. And then when you make an image, we all have a, place to walk towards, right? Yes. And what if we create metaverses and use that technology in a human-centered way with a human-centered lens to now move towards that future instead of 
you know, like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Right, exactly. And I think there's, you know, we can go into so many rabbit holes here, but um, I think there's a, we have a potential to make peace with mm -hmm. uh, the way we relate to technology. And I believe, you know, if you look at human history, everyone was hating on books when they first came out, you know, that, oh, now we're not going to talk to each other anymore. And now everyone is going to read books and it's the biggest, the worst problem ever, you know, like, People didn't like books before they came out and they started printing them because, um, you know, the church really didn't like it because they really like reading and interpreting them and not having other people have access to it. So I think it's just another tool. And just with a knife, we can make really yummy food and we can, or we, da we can also damage things. So it's really about how do we use these tools. And I don't believe that the tool necessarily is the, 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 the enemy. It is about how no, aligned right. are we how aligned are we with our hearts and how do we can, how can we practice showing up fully and authentically in every single space that we enter? And I think technology may give us this illusion that we're anonymous and that we can not, we don't have to be kind. And I think that is such a, I, I don't really understand <laughs> how someone may think this right. way. And I think I'm seeing, we're, we can see that there are really wonderful projects that are guiding us back to how do we show up authentically and really it is not about the tools it is really just about where we're at and how do we want to spend our lives right like we only have so many days and so many years yeah. to to live and how can we spend them more joyfully and joy is so important and it is always a struggle to find it and that's part of life but i think embracing that journey um can lead to a much better experience of our lives. I got a little philosophical here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, no, it's beautifully said. And I think you hit the nail on the head, which is being human-centric about it, right? Because otherwise yeah. we become obsessed with the, the tool and the tool is not the point, right? And life is the point. Being enlivened is the point. Being human is the point. So it's, it's, um, it's an important, really important thing to remember and i'm so glad people like yourself and others are actually bringing this in and manifesting and creating yeah. these environments in a way um so that we remember who we are really yeah. you know yeah and we, forget, we easily can forget and we get so caught up with a lot of things that take us away from ourselves and it's yeah it's really incredibly important so thank you for saying that um mm -hmm. You just, I mean, makes me so happy. <laughs> and I, I mean, and just to everyone who's listening here, like um, I'm, I can only encourage, like find, like I, I, I've been trying to do this for so long and I'm finally getting into a place now where I am kind of unapologetically pulling the people into my world that I just love working with and being with and it is such a wonderful place to be. And I know that is not always easy and possible for uh, folks, but I think we can all find our own ways there. And what I'm realizing in this, I mean, and, and I'm saying this because it's been a huge struggle for me to get there and it's a huge sacrifice, but um, I'm starting to see why it makes sense and why I didn't stop trying for my whole life to get to this place. And once we are there, like it just starts flowing. And I think we all deserve that yeah. flow and be being in that flow state and being inspired. And we all deserve being loved by our collaborators. Like work doesn't have to be this impersonal thing. It can be an inspired co-creative process. And, you know, there's, there's pros and cons here too. And that's a whole nother podcast, but um, <laughs> I think we can dare to be um, more joyful in every space that we enter. Well said. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Yeah. We, we all need more of that. And it's incredible, <laughs> incredible. Um, just even right now speaking with you, like I can feel the energy and it's incredibly just, it's so liberating. Yeah. It's so incredibly <laughs> uplifting. Um, so you mentioned earlier about the land projects and yes. tell us a little bit. Um, I think one of them we were discussing earlier yeah yeah um, really, really cool stuff that i know you that you're doing uh especially yeah. around restoration ecology and yes. also around death so love to hear death 
<laughs> so yes yeah, so i uh like uh, like you said earlier I, I live in portland and i um encountered a group of, uh, in the summer um that i heard had um acquired a pretty significant piece of land up in washington uh washington state it's just a 45 minute drive out of portland and um they were um and what i heard then was this there's this group that's wanting to develop this land into an agricultural community and offering you know different experiences and also they were using human body compost and uh as you know somebody who um has you know was brought up with kind of the the normal dose of fear around death you know i'm like that's interesting okay <laughs> and um and then i started uh learning more about this project and i became really fascinated by it and then what i even more get really fascinated with is my own fear and discomfort with death and um to to speak a little bit about this project it is led by a group that is known um as a um as a festival uh they used to do uh, a really wonderful um festival in, in Oregon called the Beloved Festival. And the leadership of this festival, which are really wonderful human beings, um, are uh, got uh, really curious and interested in uh, restoration work and working with land and reconnecting with land and remembering our humanity and remembering um, a place. And uh, they are um, Going and they're currently moving all of their efforts into stewarding this 800 acre property. And they are collaborating with a group up in Seattle called Recompose. Um, they are a, um, it's led by this really wonderful woman that figured out a way to um, recompose bodies within one month. So they created these really rat hexagon shaped tube things where they put human bodies into with some uh, wood chips and uh, some mulch, and the conditions uh, of this of this of these um, tubes are perfectly designed to recompose a body within a month. And uh, I highly recommend checking out. There's a few videos out there. I'm not a I'm not a scientist, and I can speak to the exact details here. But what's really exciting about this technology is thinking about death care in a different way. And for one, acknowledging the really damaging um, consequences of how we do death care today, which one is we, with cremation, we're putting carbon back into the atmosphere. And uh, traditional um, funerals are basically stuffing the body full of toxic chemicals and sticking those bodies into the soil and putting concrete over it. So we're putting our bodies into the soil full of these toxic chemicals and these chemicals they you know they leak into our water systems and it's it's like <laughs> common sense would tell you don't do that it's not a good idea and also what i personally asked myself like i'm just delaying the natural decomposition process like it'll happen eventually once those chemicals have left my body so what is my body exactly waiting for in the in the earth they're sitting there for a few decades so it's, it's quite strange and then obviously there's a built-in fear of death that i i think we all fear uh, feel um at least speaking for myself here and um what recompose this organization is is encouraging us to think about and so are other natural uh, natural funeral um methods is how do we return our bodies back to the land in a respectful way because really Mother Earth has nurtured us through this whole time. And um, I don't think I'm doing nature a service by uh, my last act being full of pollution and waste. So my last act could be, how can I become the land? How can I become the plants? And what's so wonderful about um, this project, uh, the beloved emergence project mm -hmm. is to look at we return to the land in a respectful way and this land project is the only place in the world that is using human body compost to restore this quite disturbed ecosystem that is uh that is the land and the group that we're working with here is doing really wonderful work working with state agencies 
working with uh, nonprofits and other organizations that are um, wanting to, um, to, to restore the land, to build uh, in a way that is um, as least impactful as possible and uh, also brings in people to learn about these new methods, to learn about uh, restoration, to engage actively in restoration. And um, I can speak from my own experience, when you see these piles of compost, so they deliver the piles of compost to the land, and then they're being slowly dispersed all over. So there isn't a specific place where John is here and uh, you know this other person over here, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what's co what's coming forward here now? This is becoming a really unique um, cemetery experience. And how do we step into a space that we know is actually connected to to other humans in this incredibly intimate way? And what we're helping um, this group with is to design the experiences and frameworks for experiences for how people interact and move through this environment. And I'm really excited about this because now we're speaking about how does somebody enter the site? What is the ritual? What is the pathway? How, where they go next? Where are they being invited to, to feel expansive? Where are they being invited to, um, if they want, if they choose to learn something and dig in? Or where are they being invited to literally dig in and potentially help with restoration projects. So there's this whole variety of activities that will be hosted on the land. And um, it is it is a really exciting project. And I'm so honored to be uh, yeah working with these folks. It's been really great. And we're at the very beginning or at this point, it's a uh, it's it's winter 2022. And um, and I'm really excited to see over the next few months uh, how this unfolds and what we're uh, what what will we build up there? So it's it's super exciting. And the death, um, you know, there's a there's a larger movement that um, I learned uh, about through this project as well, which is a, a kind of a death positivity movement. There's a very entertaining YouTube channel that I recommend everyone checking out. Mm -hmm. It is called the Order of the Good Death, and um, there's this uh, there one of their um, main um main leaders uh i believe her name is catherine caitlin <laughs> um and she makes these wonderful and really funny videos about everything everything about death so from like how does this work how do we cremate how does how do funeral uh you know organizations work and all the way to a better awareness for all the different options that are out there so it is, it is kind of a, I think kind of a, like a space that we don't really talk about in our society and digging in and mm -hmm. learning about like kind of the ins and outs and also the not so pretty things, I think is bringing that conversation up. And what really excited about here is to uh, also make space for conversations that are triggering, that are sad, that are difficult. And by reintegrating that, I think perhaps there is a potential here to not be as scared about it. And, you know, I'm, nobody wants to think about death. It's a very uncomfortable topic, but mm -hmm. I believe we are in this, again, interesting time in history where we, you know, let's look at everything as a tool. Like death is just another gate to a different state of being. And how can we be more, um, more open and how can we um, approach it with, yeah, this, it, it is, it is what it is. Yeah. And it is really about our energetic stance. Absolutely. As just as a reminder, this is very much a particular Western culture way of looking at death. There are many hundred percent. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks thank for clarifying. Death, right. That 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 totally embrace death as part of life because it is. We're always yeah. like our cells are always dying. Everything is dying and renewing and dying, renewing. And I, I love. I mean, this, this is such a powerful project, and it's something that's also close to my heart because. I feel absolutely that if we can make peace with death, we actually make peace with life. And yes, it's, you know. and you know, with, with the Recompose project, with the Beloved project, it's, it's, um, it's so beautiful also because then you really actively can experience what it means to rebirth from death. Because you're watching yeah. it, you're witnessing it and you're understanding it. It's right in front of you and it's yeah. inescapable. And 
there's something that's so joyous about that. So instead of being contracted about mm-hmm. death, yes. you get to really experience it as part of life, which by the way, is another way for us to connect back to nature because we're, yeah. I mean, that's what nature is. Things are, you know, yeah. you know, trees die and then there's fungi and then the next thing yeah. you know, it's, like, <laughs> you know, like it's that, that whole movie that we see all the time, right? But it, it, it's yeah. such a good reminder because it then helps us navigate and helps us live life in a more expansive way where we don't get hung up on just stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and another thing I wanted to, to because I think you beautifully kind of started to connect um, ontological design with regenerative culture. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where, you know, it, it it brings to light in a really alive way for people what regenerative culture actually means. So I'd love to 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 do you agree? Like what you just said was doing that. I mean, is is that and that's a great framework for I I think it is absolutely and I'm 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 actually really curious to hear your your take on what regenerative culture is as well. Um in my mind regenerative culture, I mean, it's so, it has so many different expressions. Uh, for me, the framework is my own way to get there because I have, I have a desire to create art and that is part of me. And this is a way to funnel it and connect it back to the human nature. Mm-hmm. And through that, by remembering who we really are and incorporating every single part of the good and the bad, everything that we show up with every day, I think that is regeneration. And I think, you know, like in, in previous decades and, and, and centuries, uh, that disconnect has not served us very well. And um, and it doesn't mean that we all, it all has to like merge and become one. It's more about acknowledging. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that a lot of the pain that we feel is uh, unacknowledged facts and unacknowledged pain and unacknowledged suffrage and mm-hmm. suffering and, and all of these things. So I think being stepping back into um, just accepting what is to me, that is regeneration. And then also how do we most in, the, in, a, in a creative way and uninhibited way build that understanding in an audacious way into our environment. And what that means is let's look at the built environment. Like so many downtown areas are all concrete, right? And so we're, we're kind of left nature behind there. So how do we now, and, and you know, and there are people out there and that are imagining the future of the cities and there's a lot of greenery in there. And that is one, one little expression of that. And similarly to, you know, like that, uh, that kind of, I don't want to call it wellness culture, but it, 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 self-care and being, you know, more mindful is becoming more hip, at least in certain bubbles. And it's very Western, Western centric here. Um, how I'm talking about this, um, but that is becoming more important. And I think those are the little beginnings and of, of those expressions of let's, let's reintegrate and let's bring it all together with us and not just leave it all behind because we don't like it. So um, I think that that desire is popping up all, all around us and it leads to a lot of really great work yeah. and yeah. it has the potential to start a movement. And, um, and if we start, if we listen to it, we can maybe join and see it. So Absolutely. What is your what is your what is your definition of regenerative culture? To to add to what you just said, to me, regenerative yeah. culture is, is really understanding the true meaning of love, right? So taking nature, right? Yeah. Nature is always there. It's always feeding us. It's it's just there providing for us. That is a very like that's a starting point. So if you understand nature and you appreciate and you you come into relationship. Um, true relationship with nature, that means you start to accept life and death because that's all it is. It's like life, something's dying, something's growing, something's dying, some, you know, animals killing another animal. And then the next time yeah. the animals, like, it's just, it's this constant, you know, uh, um, almost opposites that are in harmony in so many ways, yeah. right? Yes. And if you understand that, you come into a fuller acceptance, which you touched on, that idea of acceptance yeah. and acknowledgement. Yes. 
of mm -hmm. what one considers to be no longer are we then looking at something and saying this is bad or this is good in an absolute way or this is black and this is white right it's just guess what it's it's it exists yes and we can we can have a very um contracted way of 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 defining something and at the same time it's also its opposite and yeah. this sounds um like completely um that it doesn't make sense but really when you start to observe how nature works you really understand that and yeah. i think that in itself is in its own way a definition of love yeah. love and total acceptance and coming to it in a way where it becomes holding space for everything that's something again back to the earlier point we were making when we started this podcast about holding space and creating space for these flows to happen so that you can have the ponder you can have the practice the daydream and yeah. the, what's the last p oh, practice ponder daydream and play play very important right and so you can you can actually um encompass and embody all of those elements you know and so um yeah, that, that's the way I look at it. And regenerative, you know, you also touched on this. To me, you know, most people think of regeneration or they think of regenerative culture, they think environment, they think sustainability. And of course, it's, it's the one further than sustainability. It's how do we actually um, behave and create environments in which we actually make things better. You know, we leave things better than they even were before, right? Yeah. Um, and more enriched. And, you know, that is one thing, but we really can apply that to our own lives when you talk yes. about wellness because the way i see yeah. regen regeneration is is about how can we number one be more accepting of ourselves like all of our flaws like all the things that yeah. that, that are maybe not so not you know the pain and the joy together right and yeah. how by doing so we start to look at health for example in this yeah. particular si uh, silo that yeah. it's about not just hey i have a symptom and give me a pill and let me just take care of it and it, that which is very transactional and it becomes understanding wow i'm having a pain here because i'm having a lot of stress i'm having a lot of stress because something yeah. is off balance in my life and it's yeah. not you know and just dealing with a symptom is not actually looking at the whole system so the regenerative re regeneration regenerative culture to me also means you know in the area of health really looking at the whole system and then therefore treating ourselves in a way right where we take into all aspects of our lives not just work not just personal but how where where do we live are we living in a place that there's a lot of pollution are we then taking care of ourselves are we not working ourselves to death or are we you know so that to me is how we regenerate ourselves as human beings from a yeah. health perspective because health is many yeah. aspects it's our soul it's our heart it's our mind it's our body so that's a, a long-winded you know, <laughs> to answer to your question about what i feel regenerative yeah culture. thank you um and and i think what's also uh really like i like to think about it as almost like fractals right like we're like what I do with my own body, I'm just a little, I'm, I'm a, like society is a fractal really mm -hmm. of, of those little tiny systems and it just repeats itself. And then it's a bigger one and it's a bigger one, even that. So we're all like nestled within the other and then there are other fractals within me. So, and, and I think it's, it's really important too, to just kind of acknowledge that these processes are messy and mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not always fun and they're not all, they don't, they don't always look Instagrammable and, <laughs> Um, and I think it's, it's really, um, it's really important to be able to sit with that discomfort and, um, not necessarily, you know, like, it, <laughs> I think we can overdo that too, but, um, you know, how can we, yeah, hold space for that in a loving way and, and really look at it as an opportunity. Like I try, and I know that's really hard, um, in my just kind of personal practice here but like try to look at everything as an opportunity mm -hmm. and try to exercise problem solving skills here and be as creative as I possibly can in the ways I show up to these challenges that occur in my life 
And I think that is true for society as well. Like how can everything be an opportunity and how can we be curious and open? And I think that's kind of maybe a, a dream for how the framework can be applied. Like how can the framework create more spaciousness within ourselves to meet these challenges in a more loving and curious way and not in this contracted like fight or flight, you know, like I'm ready to fight or run away mode. And, um, and I really, I'm saying this because I've been there so many times and I will be there so many times in the future. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to build in reminders into just kind of my world around me, like opportunity and, and how can my community remind me of, hey, this is an opportunity right there. Um, right. How can my community hold me accountable? Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have this kind of, um, this illusion that we're individuals and that we're kind of can do all everything on our own like that's so not true you know like I can't make like without other people I wouldn't sit in this house and I wouldn't have a computer and I wouldn't wear clothes because I don't know how to make any of these things you know and um I think we're so inherently um symbiotic yes. and um and I think that sometimes gets a bad rap, like, oh, I'm dependent. And, but that's, that's, that's actually a beautiful thing because I don't want to come up with a, I don't want to build an iPhone from scratch. Like that take me probably a few centuries <laughs> to figure this out. So I think remembering we're a part of a human lineage of brilliance and we are so much more equipped now than ever to respond to challenges with an open mind and bring in resources and ask for help. I think asking for help is really important too. Um, a little fun tale. I think I trained myself by, uh, so I hitchhiked a lot by myself, which a lot of people thought was crazy. <laughs> when I was like in my early twenties, I, uh, I did that and it was terrifying. But what that taught me was it's okay to ask for help. And it's also okay to ask someone for help and then say you know what I don't want your help because you may not be the most trustworthy person <laughs> um, in this moment you know especially when hitchhiking you know I want to be careful but hitchhiking has kind of allowed me to program my brain towards uh, ask for help and it's okay and we really have nothing to lose other than a no and then you say awesome have a great day it's okay if you don't want to help me and yeah. that ethos carried through my whole life and it's help me build something that I'd never thought I could build. Um, and, and I'm, you know, without, you know, I didn't enter the work with a lot of support. I you kind know, of had to kind of figure it out and I can, and I'm only here because of dozens and hundreds of amazing souls that I have asked for help and that have shown up for me. And I think that's one way to also reconnect. It's who's your community how do you talk to them and how do you support your community and how also do you and how do you receive support mm -hmm. and there's so much pride that we have i'm like you know we're, we're like we're making it work ourselves and i think that is a that is an old paradigm that is worth revisiting yeah yeah no thank you for saying all of that and the messiness absolutely i mean i think that's super important and i'm super yeah. happy you brought that up because then we, and then we're, otherwise we go into judgment again, right? We're going to judgment yeah. as to, and we, we're we not forgiving with ourselves, which we need to be. And that, that again is yeah. part of giving ourselves that love and keep giving each other that love so that we, yeah. we're always judging, judging, judging. And yet, you know, so, you know, when you were saying like when you, someone gives you help and instead of saying, oh no, I'm now obligated to say yes, because this person gave me help. It's like, you know what? I still have my choice to say no. Yeah. No too it's all good yeah. right and yeah. to not judge ourselves when we need yeah. to do what is best and, and make our you know personal choices so thank yeah. you so so much olivia for being on the show i, I before i, I don't want to end on the, unless you know if you have something to more to add i didn't want to cut you off there but uh, you, no I, I i feel i feel complete I mean, I could, I could go forever, but we, it's good to wrap. <laughs> how, how does someone connect with you? What's the best way to find you? Um, you can go onto a website. Uh, it's alchemy, uh, alchemycenter.com, alchemy, uh, minus center.com. That's a great way to connect to, to us and to me. Um, and I also have a personal website. If you're interested, uh, it's Olivia Gutling with a th, uh, .com. And yeah, I think that's a great way to go. 
Yeah. Excellent. And you're amazing. Yeah. And I'm so, so, so happy that you came on the show. It's been an incredible journey of just even in this holding space for this interview has been amazing. And look what's emerged. More joy. I know. I, I just Great. want to say thank you for inviting me. And I'm really, I'm really honored to be here. And it, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm really, truly so grateful. Thank you. Same here, truly. And it's such an honor to have this interaction with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yourself and your beautiful energy. Mm -hmm.